the VDC meeting of the Security Council is gone to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is Women and Peace and Security, Sexual Violence in Conflict. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council of Provisional Rules of Procedures, I invite the following briefers to participate in this meeting. Ms. Pramila Patton, Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict. Dr. Danit McWage, Nobel Peace Prize Laureate. Ms. Caroline Atim, Rector of South Sudan Women with Disabilities Network. And Ms. Berkit Atinja Collins, Senior Women Protection Advisors, United Nations Multidimensional Integrated Stabilization Mission in the Central African Republic, MINUSCA. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. I wish to draw the attention of the council members to document S-2021-3118. The report of Secretary General on conflict-related sexual violence and document S-2021-333 a letter dated April 5th, 2021, from the Permanent Representative of Vietnam, addressed to the Secretary, to the Secretary General, sorry, transmitting a concept paper on the item under consideration. I now give the floor to Ms. Pramila Patton. Mr. President, distinguished members of the Security Council. Today's meeting is a critical opportunity to take stock of both the persistent and entrenched, as well as new and emerging challenges in our collective efforts to eradicate the scourge of conflict-related sexual violence. Building up upon our debate last year, which focused on turning commitments into compliance and pursuing a survivor-centered rights-based approach in all prevention and response efforts, we now meet to assess and address the gaps that remain. Many of these gaps and challenges have been exacerbated over the past year by a pandemic that has arrested the attention of the world. Concerted efforts are needed to ensure that survivors of sexual violence are not obscured beneath the long shadow cast by this unprecedented crisis. In that respect, I would like to sincerely appreciate the leadership of Vietnam for convening this debate, which shines a spotlight on the issue during dark and difficult times. I warmly welcome the civil society briefer from South Sudan, as well as our senior women protection advisor from the Central African Republic, and Nobel Laureate Dr. Denis Mukwege, whose first-hand frontline perspectives will enrich our search for solutions. Mr. President, we meet at a moment when this crime, which should have been consigned to a closed chapter of history, is once again in the headlines. In the remote mountainous regions of North and Central Tigray, women and girls are being subjected to sexual violence with a level of cruelty beyond comprehension. Healthcare workers are documenting new cases of rape and gang rape daily, despite their fear of reprisals and attacks on the limited shelters and clinics still in operation. The report before us records allegations of over 100 rape cases since hostilities erupted in November 2020. It may be many months before we know the full scale and magnitude, the extent and impact of these atrocities. There is no question that this Council has adopted groundbreaking resolutions to combat sexual violence. But the question could be asked, what do these resolutions mean right now on the ground in Tigray? When history looks back on this painful episode, 
as part of the long litany of battles fought on the bodies of women and girls from Bosnia to Rwanda, Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere, we will rightly be asked what we did to honor our commitments. For its part, my office has engaged with the authorities at the highest level to offer technical assistance and support, and will continue to closely monitor the situation, calling for restraint, humanitarian access, service provision, and effective investigation. Mr. President, the chasm between resolutions and reality, between aspirations and operations, is also evident on every page of the 12th Annual Report of the Secretary General before us today. This report covers 18 country situations and documents over 2,500 UN-verified cases of conflict-related sexual violence committed in the course of 2020. As in previous years, the vast majority of these incidents targeted women and girls, 96%. Reports of sexual violence against men and boys were recorded in almost all of the countries examined, with the majority occurring in detention settings. Eight verified cases were found to target LGBTQI individuals. While such figures convey the severity and brutality of verified incidents, they do not reflect the global scale or prevalence of this crime. The chronic underreporting of wartime sexual violence due to stigma, insecurity, fear of reprisals, and lack of services has been compounded by COVID-19 containment measures, lockdowns, curfews, quarantines, fears of contracting or transmitting the virus, mobility restrictions, and limited access to services as shelters close and clinics were repurposed for the pandemic response, all added a layer of complexity to existing structural, institutional, and sociocultural barriers to reporting. Proactive measures to foster an enabling environment for survivors to safely come forward and seek redress have become more urgent than ever. Many survivors have broken their silence, but many others have been broken by the silence forced upon them. Shame, isolation, rejection, and the anguish of having nowhere to turn has shattered lives and livelihoods. Alongside the data, the report also surfaces human stories. The mother and daughter in Eastern DRC who fled a rebel attack on their village only to be raped by government soldiers arriving to fight the rebels. The displaced families who live in constant fear of being forced to marry their women and girls to armed elements in the Central African Republic. The girl who was gang raped by four armed men in Tripoli whose family refused to file a complaint due to social norms around honor, shame, and victim blame, coupled with fears of retaliation. The adolescent girl who was gang raped by three soldiers as she harvested fruit near a displacement camp in Darfur. The survivors of ISIL captivity who were forced to abandon their children conceived as a result of rape due to a lack of social acceptance. And the Bosnian woman who was raped in 1995 and is still seeking redress for the physical and psychological trauma she endured. Each of these cases cries out for justice. The survivor-centered approach articulated in Resolution 2467 demands that their voices be heard and heeded in policy and programmatic decisions, that they be treated with dignity and provided with quality, multi-sectoral assistance and that they be seen by their societies as the holders of rights that will ultimately be respected and enforced. Protection is tied to participation and power, yet this is imperiled by a global political climate of pushback on women's rights and shrinking civic space, evident in a disturbing trend of misogynistic attacks on women's human rights defenders and reprisals against women who are vocal and visible in public life. At a time when the Secretary General has called for a global ceasefire to focus on defeating this disease, COVID-19 has given rise to new gender-based protection concerns. The report 
records cases of sexual violence against women detained for alleged violations of curfews and quarantines, as well as violations by armed groups that have taken advantage of the pandemic to intensify their operations and gain ground. The report makes a case for survivors' rights, needs, and voices to inform national response and recovery plans as part of fostering a more equitable post-COVID era. At the same time, the report recognizes that the UN system, service providers, and civil society organizations swiftly pivoted to virtual approaches, such as hotlines, remote case management, and new referral and coordination networks, thereby avoiding a data blackout. Despite these innovations, many of those hardest hit by the overlapping crisis of conflict, displacement, and COVID-19 have also been hardest to reach, notably in crowded displacement settings where access to information and services is scarce and women are forced to navigate the gender and digital divide. Marginalized women tend to be left further and further behind in times of crisis and social stress. To bring the structural root causes of sexual violence into focus, the report views the issue through the lens of intersectionality ensuring that survivors are not simply treated as a homogeneous group. It demonstrates how intersecting forms of inequality based on ethnic or political affiliation, age, disability, sexual orientation and gender identity, income and migratory status increase the risk faced by diverse individuals in the context of historical power asymmetries, which are structural and systemic. The report illustrates the nexus between sexual violence, conflict-driven trafficking in persons, and violent extremism, which requires cross-border cooperation and regional response capabilities, notably in the Lake Chad Basin, where the ongoing Boko Haram insurgency exacts a heavy toll on women and girls. While some patterns of conflict-related sexual violence transcend national borders, Others persist at the sub subnational level. The intensification of entrenched, localized conflict is a concerning trend that perpetrates cycles of sexual violence, including in the context of tensions over the Transhumanist co Corridor in the Central African Republic and Sudan. Community based militia have used rape, forced marriage, and sexual slavery as part of identity and resource based conflicts in the DRC, Somalia, and South Sudan, though this rarely features on the radar of global security bodies. The lack of service coverage in isolated areas due to weak state presence and infrastructure has become all the more acute during the pandemic. The report calls for sexual and reproductive health care to be designated as an essential service in order to avoid its defunding and deprioritization deprior in light of the painful lesson from past epidemics that more women die from a lack of access to reproductive health care than from the disease itself. In rural and remote regions, the distance to health structures is vast and transportation is limited, preventing many survivors from accessing care within the 72-hour post-rape window needed to prevent HIV, STIs, and unwanted pregnancy. Service delivery and material assistance cannot be dismissed as a secondary issue for security stakeholders, but is in fact the ultimate expression of political will. Meeting the basic needs of survivors and communities at risk doubles as a form of protection against exploitation and abuse. Greater attention must be paid to the risk of desperate families resorting to harmful coping mechanisms such as early and forced marriage in response to physical and financial insecurity. As a critical pillar of prevention and deterrence, the report calls for enhanced efforts to close the accountability and reparations gap. While important developments took place at both the national and international level in 2020, such as the trial and conviction of notorious warlords Sheka and Leonso for war crimes, including rape in North Kivu, and the first conviction by the International Criminal Court 
for the crime of forced pregnancy against a member of the LRA. In other cases, investigations were stalled and prosecutions paralyzed owing to COVID-19 restrictions. Although committed on a widespread and systematic scale by terrorist groups, sexual violence has not been prosecuted in the context of counter-terrorism trials. This means that no legal precedent has been set recognizing victims of sexual violence as legitimate victims of terrorism on a basis of equality before the law. In terms of transitional justice, momentum was observed in South Sudan where the authorities announced the establishment of the African Union Hybrid Court. Last month, the Iraqi Council of Representatives adopted the Yezidi Survivors Law, which provides support for victims of ISIL's atrocities. My office has also developed model legislative guidance on conflict-related sexual violence to assist states to harmonize domestic laws with international standards. The report notes that in some cases, the adoption of protective legal frameworks stalled, not only due to COVID restraints, but following opposition from traditional and religious leaders as seen in Somalia. This highlights the need to mobilize a broad constituency in both the formal and informal spheres to promote social change. While reparations have been awarded in many cases, they generally remain unpaid, leaving victims empty-handed, even as illicit arms and revenue flow into the hands of the perpetrators. This year's report lists 52 parties credibly suspected of committing or being responsible for patterns of sexual violence in situations on the agenda of the Council. Over 70% are persistent perpetrators, having appeared on the list for five or more years without taking remedial or corrective action. It is critical to ensure greater coherence between the practice of listing and the practice of levying targeted and graduated measures by sanctions committees. If applied in a timely and consistent manner, sanctions can change the calculus of parties that operate on the assumption that rape is costly or even profitable in the political economy of war in which women are trafficked, traded, and sold. Sexual violence does not occur in a vacuum that is tied to broader security dynamics, such as the resurgence of hostilities, the rise of violent extremism, arms proliferation, population displacement, and collapsed rule of law. These factors trigger renewed patterns of sexual violence, which the report finds to be concentrated in contexts of abduction, captivity, displacement, detention, in the vicinity of military bases, in private homes during raids, at checkpoints, and in rural areas where women undertake livelihood activities. All tools must work in tandem to protect civilians at risk, support survivors, reform security sectors, and compel compliance by parties. This comprehensive approach is reflected in the 11 joint communique and frameworks of cooperation that my office has signed with conflict-affected countries to anchor national ownership. The most recent is the framework of cooperation assigned with the government of Sudan in March 2020, which includes efforts to address sexual violence as an integral part of the broader political and democratic transition. In all contexts, it is critical to emphasize that policies of zero tolerance cannot carry zero consequences. Mr. President, distinguished council members, building back better in the wake of this pandemic requires an inclusive, intersectional, and gender-informed approach. Let us not miss or misunderstand this moment. This, this is not just a point in time. It is a turning point in history. The pandemic demands a paradigm shift to silence the guns and amplify the voices of women, to invest in public welfare rather than in instruments of warfare. We need to shift the leadership paradigm to ensure the representation of women and survivors themselves. We need to shift the public spending paradigm to reduce military expenditure and strengthen institutions. And we need to shift the security paradigm
to foster human security and re resilience to social and economic shocks. The pandemic has laid bare the intersecting inequalities that plague our societies as compounded by conflict, displacement, and institutional fragility. The only cure for these overlapping ills is an injection of political resolve and resources equal to the scale of the challenge. It is not the time to return to the status quo, but rather to dig deeper and tackle the root causes of this problem as never before. From Tigray to Tripoli, from the Kivus to the camps of Darfur, women across the world look to this council to realize the vision set out in its 10 transformative women, peace, and security resolutions. A gender-responsive global pandemic recovery is everyone's business. It is unfinished business, but it cannot be business as usual. It is time to write a new social contract in which no military or political leader is above the law and no woman or girl is beneath the scope of his protection. It is time for decisive action to mitigate the risk of sexual violence before it has begun. As history has taught us, prevention is the best and only cure. Thank you. I thank Ms. Patton for her briefing. And I now give the floor to Dr. Danit Makwich. Thank you, President of the Council. Secretary General, Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict, Representatives of States, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank the mission of Vietnam to the United Nations for inviting me to speak today during this open debate on conflict-related sexual violence. 2020 saw the 20th anniversary of Resolution 1325 and of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda at the Security Council. We welcome the fact that our struggle to support the dignity of women who survive sexual violence is on the international community's agenda and that the issue of conflict-related sexual violence is finally gaining visibility amongst decision makers and political representatives. Nevertheless, the progress in international law should not hide the fact that the scourge of sexual violence, which is a real pandemic, continues to prevail in all situations of conflict. In addition, responses remain underfunded and the climate of impunity for sexual, related sexual crimes remains, remains more the rule than the exception. Ladies and gentlemen, we are still far away from being able to draw a red line against the use of rape and sexual violence as a strategy of war, domination and terror. Thus, our fight continues to build a world where every woman and every girl has the right to live a life safe from violence because the overwhelming majority of victims still do not receive the assistance and the support that they need, nor do they have access to justice and the reparations for the atrocities that they have suffered. The great challenge that we must tackle today is the effective implementation of the existing normative framework and to make the numerous commitments undertaken by the Security Council into tangible realities to benefit survivors. It is in this context that we welcome the determination of the Secretary General and of his special representative to transform these commitments into obligations and these resolutions that have been adopted into results. We took note of this willingness expressed in the various recommendations in the recent report of the Secretary General. The aim is to bridge gaps in the global strategy to fight sexual violence and to implement the measures adopted in the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Amongst these gaps, 
and the Secretary General comes to the bitter conclusion, and rightly so in his report, that during the, over the first 10 years of the mandate for the Special Representative for Sexual Violence in Conflict, no individual or entity that who has perpetrated acts of sexual violence has been targeted by Security Council sanctions because they have committed sexual violence. Thus, we welcome the fact that the Council has imposed sanctions on the head of the armed group 3R, Retour Reclamation Rehabilitation, in the Central African Republic. In This was in August 2020. This is because the head of this group planned, ordered or committed acts of sexual violence, including rape. We do hope that this important precedent will not be a one-off because everyone here can recognise that the efforts of accountability and justice are the best tools for prevention. So while these odious crimes are not punished and sanctions, they, can, they will continue. However, it is the weak link in all strategies that seek to res respond to sexual violence and to discourage potential perpetrators and their chains of political and military command from committing these barbarous acts, which bring shame on our shared sense of humanity. I thus reiterate my appeal to the international community and to states to draw a red line against the use of rape and sexual violence as a weapon of war. A red line would be synonymous with blacklists, with economic, financial and political sanctions, as well as judicial prosecutions against those per perpetrators and instigators of these odious crimes. Ladies and gentlemen, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, we are continue here at the Ponzi Hospital, where I am at the moment. We're continuing our efforts to respond to the sexual violence, the conflict-related sexual violence, and we have a holistic assistance model which is based on four pillars. These are medical, psychological, socio-economic and legal. This one-stop centre model is focused on survivors and the aim is to bring together in one place all of the support for women's health that we can provide. So within a system, within a primary healthcare system, this is to avoid discrimination and stigmatization. But this is only responding to the consequences of violence. First and foremost, we must prevent uh, these crimes from being committed again. And this is done through strengthening our efforts against impunity. Victims not only do have the right to holistic, good quality care, but they also have a right to justice, to truth, and to reparation. Various Security Council resolutions have shed light on the fact that impunity that alleged perpetrators of these gravest crimes enjoy has and remains once of the main, one of the main obstacles to establishing peace and stability in the DRC. And it explains to a great extent how the perpetration of mass atrocities uh, so convinced it's so far in the provinces in the east of the country, particularly in Ituri and in the Kivu. This is the reason behind our advocacy efforts to implement the recommendations of the mapping report on the gravest violations of human rights and humanitarian law committed in the DRC between 1993 and 2003. This is one of the darkest periods in the contemporary history of the country. Then women and young girls paid a heavy price and then all fi fighting forces, both Congolese and foreign, used mass and systematic rape and sexual violence as a strategy to sow terror and subjugation. However, more than 10 years after its publication by the U United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, non of the recommendations in this report, which seek to establish all tools for transitional justice, has been implemented. And this is particularly shocking given the breadth and the gravity of the crimes committed that have been committed against civilians for decades. And these crimes are continuing to this day.
ladies and gentlemen, we wish to draw the attention of the members of the Security Council to the fact that political and military solutions have so far failed to bring stability to the DRC. And they have failed to ensure the protection of civilians. While the Congolese Authority and the United Nations have begun discussions on a strategy for a gradual withdrawal, a progressive withdrawal of MONUSCO, it is vital, in our view, to put the fight against impunity, as well as the use of all mechanisms for transitional justice, at the heart of this strategy. This is done by sort of focusing on the, the need to prioritise far-reaching security sector reform and judicial prosecutions through the implementation of international or internationalized mechanisms for prosec to prosecute and to try the, these gross gravest of crimes. I would like to thank you for the actions that you are going to take to put an end to imp impunity and to support the implementation of a holistic strategy for transitional justice in the DRC. This need for justice is a vital prerequisite to break the cycle of violence and instability. It is a sine qua non in order to make progress towards sustainable development and peace. Together, we can put an end to sexual violence and we can act for human dignity, for justice and for peace. I thank you very much. I thank Dr. Markwich for his briefing. And now with the floor to Ms. Caroline Atim. Thank you so much. Minister President, Excellency, Civil Society Committee, ladies and gentlemen, greetings to you all. Thank you for this opportunity to deliver this statement on behalf of the NGO Working Group on Women, Peace, and Security. I am Caroline Atim, Executive Director of Southern Women with Disability Network an organization working with women, uh, women with disabilities, and also working with the survivors of gender-based violence. Today, I speak on behalf of these survivors, as well as women and girls with disabilities. I am a deaf woman. My sign language is Africa will be making my statement today. Despite the peace deal, South Sudan remains anchored by intercommunal, ethnic, political, and armed conflict, where gender-based violence is deliberately used as a tool of humiliation against women and girls. More than 65% of South Sudan women have experienced sexual or physical violence, a figure that doubles the global average and among the highest in the world. A little combination of impunity for perpetrators and deep rooted inequality and discrimination means that sexual violence against women and girls is not taken serious as a crime. Even before the current conflict, rest in marriage was considered acceptable. And more than 50% of girls married before they turn 18. The situation has only worsened due to the conflict and the COVID 19 pandemic. Survivors are often forced to marry their refugees. This inhuman and unjust practice must end. Mr. President, Globally, women and girls with disabilities are two to three times more likely to experience gender-based violence, abuse, and exploitation, especially during conflict, as they face increased isolation, lose access to support networks, may have limited mobility, or can be left behind. Let me share the example of a young girl whose heartbreaking story 
we have faced the suffering of women and girls with disability. In 2014, a deaf 14-year-old girl was raped by birthday. After being abandoned by family members who fled the fighting in war, she was unable to communicate her trauma to anyone or seek necessary health service in the immediate aftermath. When I met her and was able to communicate with her in sign language, we were able to understand what happened to her and provide her with the immediate care, only to find out that she was HIV positive. Had she had access to an interpreter and timely medical care, she could have been helped sooner. But these necessary services were not available to her, and she had to suffer in silence. This is unacceptable. This story illustrates how the suffering of women and girls with disabilities is compounded by the discrimination they already face. They are easy prey for rapists who know they act with impunity for women with disabilities. Even, even more than Others may not be believed if they report this violence. They often struggle to access limited or inadequate health facilities, self shelter, or even basic health and legal information. The COVID 19 pandemic has made these conditions even worse due to lockdown and interruption of services. And yet, response to gender-based violence often neglects the specific needs of women and girls with disabilities, and very limited data is systematically collected about our experience, including by the United Nations. Instead, there is lack of understanding of our rights, combined with stereotypes that we cannot make choices for ourselves and that our perspectives do not matter. In situations where survivors of sexual violence bear children, both the children and the women who bear or raise them can face stigma discrimination, and devastating consequences due to the deep-rooted gender inequalities. These women often ostracized by their communities and abandoned, leaving them with few resources and long-lasting physical and psychosocial trauma. The only way to address the tragedy of these women and girls and their children is to address the prevailing inequality and protect their fundamental rights. The rights, experiences, and voices of survivors must be at the center of any response to gender based violence. This includes survivors with disabilities. Survivors have fundamental rights that entitle them to services according to their specific needs. They must have access to comprehensive, accessible, and non discriminatory services, including psychosocial, sexual, and reproductive health and rights, mental health care access to legal services, and training to develop livelihood skills. This is what a robust survival center effort looks like. Currently, the widespread availability of firearms in our highly militarized, militarized society leaves women at the risk of all forms 
of the gender based barriers. The sale of illicit weapons must be stopped to ensure women's, women's safety. Perpetrators must be held accountable through a hybrid court, which should be established and fully functional in accordance with Chapter 5 of the Liberalized Peace Agreement. All parties must prioritize the full, equal, and meaningful participation and leadership of women in all of their diversity, including those with disabilities in all aspects of the current peace process and ensure that the 75% quota provided in the liberal life peace agreement is met. South Sudan must respect its human rights obligation and all the relevant United Nations Security Council resolution, including resolution, 24 75 on persons with disabilities and also those on women, peace and security. Mr. President, we need an end to war and violence in South Sudan. The lives of thousands of South Sudanese women and girls cannot be traded aware of a momentary break from fighting. If then their suffering is forgotten, our wounds will never heal. We need inclusivity, justice, and reconciliation with the past. The Security Council can and must fulfill its obligation to the people of South Sudan and to the many women and girls in conflict around the world to whom it is committed to ending one and for all, all forms of gender violence. Thank you. Thank you. I thank Ms. Atim for her special briefing. Also, thank the translator. I now give the floor to Ms. Berghitz, a teacher college. Mr. President, distinguished members of the Security Council, thank you for the inv invitation to speak at this important event. I'm greatly honored. Today, exactly one year ago, I left Bangui on board the last commercial flight to Europe as a prevention measure due to the COVID-19 pandemic. With me were many colleagues from international organizations and some of those that provide medical services to victims of sexual violence. At that time, the prediction was that the weak health system would not be able to deal with a general outbreak of COVID-19. Now, one year on, the official number of COVID cases in the Central African Republic stands at 5,682 confirmed cases with 5,112 recoveries and 75 deaths. Within the UN family, we counted 749 cases and deplore six deaths. Early summer of 2020, most of us who had left returned to the country and resumed their work in the field. Internal flights have long since resumed and humanitarian services continue to operate. With testing rare, COVID-19 looms over the country with an unknown magnitude. The general population does not wear masks and motor taxis carry multiple passengers. Despite continuous sensitization carried out by the mission, there is no social distancing outside the work environment of international organizations. The virus seems a neglected enemy in a place where so many other challenges exist. I've served in MINUSCA for over five years, and unfortunately the COVID-19 crisis we witness is not the only one affecting service provision for victims of grave human rights violations, including sexual violence. Over the past five months, the National Army and bilateral forces carried out military operations against armed groups, in particular against those that formed the Coalition des Patriotes pour le Changement, ahead of the first round of presidential and legislative elections in December last year. 
Numerous installations of humanitarian organizations were destroyed or occupied by combatants, and hospitals were looted, bringing service provision to a halt. Humanitarian access to many regions have become from risky to impossible due to the numerous thefts of vehicles and bridges being deliberately destroyed. These violent clashes in many parts of the country contrasts with periods of hope and positive developments. On 27 of December, I joined many of my colleagues to observe the election day in Bangui. It was amazing to see the thousands of people streaming to the voting centers, queuing patiently, sometimes for hours, to cast their ballots. And all of the women I talked to were keen to assure me that it didn't matter how long they had to wait, as long as they would be able to exercise their civic duty and vote. In March, during my field visit to Bambari, the women's associations there assured me that they continue to support survivors of sexual violence, despite the fact that their office building could not be used. They had stored all their equipment at the safe place as a preventive measure before the armed groups had invaded the town in December. As senior women's protection advisor, my role is to advise and support MINUSCA civilian, police and military components in implementing the mandate to prevent and respond to conflict-related sexual violence. In my work, I have come to understand two crucial areas that define the extent of the response to conflict-related sexual violence. One is the social obstacles that impede survivors from reporting violations. The other concerns access to justice. In March, two NGOs reported the following, I quote, one of the most common forms of violence suffered by adolescents, which has continued to affect the latter during the recent armed crisis in Guali and Damara, is sexual violence. The attitude of indifference of the community towards this problem appears to further fuel the impunity enjoyed by the perpetrators. In the current crisis situation, this is exacerbated by insecurity and hunger. End of quote. Guali and Damara are less than 100 kilometers north of Bangui. In more rural areas, other barriers prevent survivors of sexual violence from seeking justice. This includes stigmatization, rejection by the family and community, and reprisals by the perpetrators. In the majority of the locations outside Bangui, there is no functional chain of justice, with courts inoperational and prosecutors absent. Equally, in large parts of the country, access to health facilities is difficult or impossible due to weak infrastructure. At this point, I want to speak about some of my most inspiring encounters with civil society and survivors of sexual violence. Our mandate spells out the role of civil society and community leaders in enabling access to services for survivors and shapes our support to partners. While the mission works to strengthen the justice system in the long run, there also has to be a focus on immediate remedies for survivors. One of the first is to restore their dignity. As one NGO partner said to me, we want to show them they are not alone, that there are others in such situation and give them something they can do to improve their confidence. Last year, I visited a project in the north of Bria in the center of the country developed by MINUSCA's Community Violence Reduction Program. Men and women, some of them survivors of sexual violence, were tending to their plot where they grew vegetables. The women did not want to speak about the violence they had suffered, but they did proudly show me the growth of their plants, the prospect of some income and personal independence, income generating activities to regain control of one's life during the long wait for justice. Traveling in the field can mean you spend eight, five hours for a few kilometers of distance. But roads are the veins of the country, which bring support from the centers to the isolated areas. Where the population has no means to travel, regular visits of the mission and humanitarians connect them to essential services. On our way back from the farming project, our convoy was stopped in a small village along the axis. The village chief was waiting with a father of a girl, a victim of rape, who had walked over 15 kilometers to reach the main road, waiting for us to pass so he could report the crime. 
I reported the case to UNPO, which then initiated an investigation. And while that region still awaits the re-establishment of courts and state authorities, our programs and support to local partners are the first steps to hear victims, provide assistance, and restore their sense of confidence and belief in a future where impunity will give way to justice and development. I thank you for your attention. I thank Ms. Colleen for a briefing. And I now give the floor to those members who wish to make their statement. I give the floor to the representative of the United States. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and thank you so much for convening this very important debate. I want to also thank uh, the SRSG for her remarks and her comments and and thank all of uh, the briefers for uh, your interventions today. And it's really great to see you, uh, Dr. Mnguede. It's been a while since we, we've seen each other. The United States greatly appreciates the work of the UN on this issue, and in particular, the work done by the Office of the Special Representative on Sexual Violence and Conflict. We are extremely proud of our continued support for the SRSG's office and our contributions to this office to help facilitate their important work. And we strongly encourage other member states to provide support. Around the world, sexual violence is used as a deliberate tactic in armed conflict, whether to terrorize, destabilize, or break bonds within communities. That makes conflict-related sexual violence a security issue and a human rights issue, and it demands collective action. In particular, right now, the Security Council needs to pay attention to deeply disturbing reports of mass sexual violence occurring in Ethiopia's Tigray region. We as a council must address reports of women being forced by military elements to have sex for basic commodities and reports of sexual violence against women and girls in refugee camps, among other horrific information. The international community must work to ensure that all those involved respect their obligations under international human rights law and international humanitarian law. And the international community must establish immediate protection mechanisms, humanitarian aid, and other needed services for survivals. Independent, credible investigations must be conducted to hold perpetrators of these and other human rights abuses and violations committed in Tigray accountable. And in Burma, where the same military leaders responsible for a campaign of sexual violence in Rakhine State have now returned to power. Women and girls across the country are facing even graver risk. Of course, gender-based violence is a crisis around the world. One in every three women will experience physical or sexual violence in their lifetime. That is beyond a crisis. That is a calamity. The pandemic has made the situation even more dire. Social isolation and financial desperation have led to a spike in gender-based violence this past year, especially intimate partner violence and violence against girls. So I'd like to talk about three ways we can address this emergency. First, we can help prevent sexual violence by elevating women and putting them into positions of power. It is absolutely essential that women fully, equally, and meaningfully participate in peace and security processes. After all, women make the world more peaceful, and that is not anecdotal. That is a fact. By promoting women's participation in leadership in politics and mediation and in negotiations, we promote more security and peace. And by doing that, we will help prevent sexual violence and conflict from ever happening in the first place. Second, the best way to address gender-based violence after it happens, especially when it's used as a weapon of war, is to take a survivor-centered approach. That means providing survivors with access to medical care, particularly clinical management of rape, psychosocial support, and sexual and reproductive health services. It also means providing survivors with social support and legal services, all to create a supportive environment in which a survivor's rights 
are respected and the survivors treated with dignity and respect. For our part, President Biden has committed the United States to providing sexual and reproductive health care and services for women around the world, especially women who have been impacted by conflict-related sexual violence. Third and finally, we must pay special attention to underexamined and underreported forms of sexual violence. In many places, for example, the, LGB, the LGBTQI plus community faces outsized levels of sexual violence. We must more closely examine what, we, what can be done to safely identify survivors and provide necessary support for this community, particularly medical care and psychosocial support. Also underreported and underexamined is the impact of sexual violence on men and boys. In Afghanistan, for example, the terrible practice of bacha bazi, the commercial and sexual exploitation of boys, is well documented as occurring within the security forces and is exacerbated by the country's conflict. The scourge of sexual violence must be eradicated in all of its forms, especially as a weapon of war. Speaking more broadly on gender-based violence, the United States has called the increased rate of violence over the last year, the shadow pandemic. While I'd say it's time to bring gender-based violence out of the shadows. Together, we have to work to shine a light on it. And let's treat this like an emergency with the urgency that it demands. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the United States for her statement, and I give the floor to the representative of China. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, China wishes to thank Vietnam for the initiative to hold today's open debate, and to thank SRSG Ms. Patton and the other briefers for their briefings. Their comments and suggestions will help the Security Council better discuss and handle this important issue. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, armed conflicts and terrorist activities do not press the pause button, while humanitarian and security crises continued unabated. As the latest report of the Secretary General pointed out, sexual violence is still used as a means of war and terrorism, with women in conflicts bearing the brunt and suffering the most. China firmly opposes the use of sexual violence as a means of war and strongly condemns any acts of sexual violence against women and girls. China calls on the international community to attach great importance to the issue and implement integrated policies to eliminate sooner conflict-related sexual violence, CISV, and advance the WPS agenda so that new progress can be achieved continuously. First, we must focus on tackling the root causes and increase imports into conflict prevention and maintaining peace. Secretary General Guterres once emphasized in his report that the ultimate goal of the agenda to combat CRSV is not to make conflicts free of sexual violence, but rather to make the world free of wars. As long as conflicts and wars continue, there will be the possibility that sexual violence may be used as a means of war and terrorism. The international community should focus on resolving the root causes to complete, completely eradicate the breeding grounds for CRSV. Follow such principles as non-interference in internal affairs and non-use of force, and stay committed to settling disputes through peaceful means. The Security Council should actively promote political settlements of hotspot issues and play a greater role in conflict prevention and peacekeeping. Parties to conflict should earnestly follow and effectively implement the Secretary General's Global Ceasefire Appeal and resolve their differences through dialogue and consultation. Second, 
We must promote gender equality and women's empowerment, and support women in playing a greater role in economic and social development and peace and security. The problem of CRSV does not occur in a vacuum. It often reflects deep-seated frictions due to gender inequality and insufficient development, among others. The COVID-19 pandemic has dealt a severe blow to the conflict areas, putting women in an even more vulnerable position. Under the overall framework of women's empowerment and development, the international community must respond to the issue of CRSV in an integrated manner, endeavor to eliminate gender-based discrimination and differential treatment, advance women's development and economic and social development simultaneously, and create synergy with achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It is necessary to continue to support women's broader and deeper participation in the peace process and in carrying out mediation, while giving women more opportunities to participate in decision-making decision with enhanced capacity and voice. Third, the country's concerns should take the lead with supports to their efforts provided. The country's concerned bear the primary responsibility for preventing and combating CRSV and protecting women and children in their respective countries. The international community should encourage and support the countries concerned in advancing the WPS agenda according to their national conditions and in taking strong actions to combat CRSV. On the basis of respect for the sovereignty and, and jurisdiction of all countries, the international community should help the countries concerned strengthen security and judicial capacity building, among other aspects. Relevant UN entities should carry out their work based on their respective mandates and expertise, do their best with existing resources, strengthen coordination, and forge synergy. It is necessary to support regional and sub-regional organizations to leverage their unique advantages and encourage them to explore programs and practices based on the actual conditions of their regions. Women's groups and civil society need to be guided to play a constructive role. Mr. President, women in armed conflict is one of the 12 key areas lifted in the Beijing Declaration and the Platform for Action as the host country of the Fourth World Conference on Women and an advocate for gender equality and women's empowerment, China will continue to work with the international community to make greater contributions to the elimination of CRSV sooner and to advancing global women's development. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of China for his statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to all of our briefers for their compelling and informative testimonies. The UK is proud to be a partner in this vital work. Sexual violence is a feature of conflict in countries around the world but we're particularly concerned about the credible and widely corroborated reports of rape and sexual violence in Tigray. We urge Ethiopia to work closely with the Office of the Special Representative on Sexual Violence in Conflict to address this. Caroline Atim's briefing reminded us, too, of the disproportionate impact of gender-based violence on women and girls in South Sudan. There have been ambitious commitments, but little peace dividend for women and girls in South Sudan. We look to South Sudan to expedite the establishment of the hybrid court and to partner with the UN to deliver justice. In these and other post-conflict situations, survivors carry the effects of their trauma, while perpetrators most often walk free. So first, I want to underline the UK's commitment to tackling sexual violence in conflict. We are the only country with a Prime Minister's special representative on preventing sexual violence in conflict, with a dedicated team and funding. Since 2012, we've committed over £48 million to supporting survivors, 
tackling stigma and reducing impunity, supporting projects across 29 countries. Second, I want to emphasize, as we've heard from our speakers, the importance of a survivor-centered and human rights-based approach, which prioritizes the rights and needs of survivors. That includes the right to accessible sexual and reproductive health care services and access to justice, which take into account the specific needs of victims and survivors living with disabilities, LGBTQI individuals, and other at-risk groups. The UK has committed £1.3 million to the Global Survivors Fund, run by Dr McQuaige, which works to ensure survivors of conflict-related sexual violence have access to reparations and other forms of redress in conflict and post-conflict countries. In the last year, the UK has also launched two key tools to support survivors. First, last June, Lord Ahmed, the Prime Minister's Special Representative, launched the draft Murad Code for Global Consultations. This is a code of behaviour for those collecting evidence to respect survivors' rights and ensure investigation is safer, more ethical and more effective. And second, last November, Lord Ahmed inaugurated the Declaration of Humanity by faith and belief leaders, which calls for the prevention of sexual violence in conflict and denounces the stigma faced by survivors including by children born of rape. Finally, alongside supporting survivors, we must do all we can to ensure accountability for the use of sexual violence as a weapon of, of war. As the SRSG said, zero tolerance cannot have zero consequences. The recent UN Security Council Resolution 2564 sanctions against Sultan Zabin demonstrated that the international community can and will take action against perpetrators of torture and sexual violence in conflict. But there is more we can do to strengthen accountability for these crimes in UN-supported international and hybrid criminal courts and tribunals so that perpetrators are justly prosecuted. As we've heard, there are millions today who are affected by conflict-related sexual violence, survivors, children born of sexual violence, families, entire communities. I thank the presidency for convening this debate and our briefers for highlighting the problem and what can be done. I assure you of our continuing support to end the use of sexual violence in conflict and as a weapon of war. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom for her statement, and I give the floor to the representative of Mexico. Señor Presidente, México agradece. Thank you, President. Mexico thanks Vietnam for convening this debate and the Secretary General for presenting his report whose recommendations we endorse. My country sees with great disquiet and indignation the situation uh, laid out in the report on the increase in sexual violence related to conflicts and its recurrent use as a tactic of war, repression and torture by state and non-state armed groups, which have seize the opportunity of this pandemic to continue committing atrocities. My country, Mexico, condemns the very serious situation of sexual violence which we can observe in many current conflicts, whether this be in Ethiopia, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Somalia, Sudan and South Sudan, just to mention a few regrettable cases. The lockdowns and quarantines have significantly exacerbated sexual and gender-based violence at global levels. If we add to this the differentiated impact upon women and girls resulting from the increased power amongst those who control weapons, 
and who perpetrate acts of sexual violence with impunity, the result is simply devastating. It is imperative, President, to address the correlation between the proliferation and trafficking in small and light arms and light weapons and gender violence. This often results in sexual violence in conflict situations and in post-conflict situations. Whilst we do have frameworks and mechanisms to prevent and address conflict-related sexual violence, including the mandate of the Special Representative, there is a long way to go to transform social norms which perpetuate patriarchies, systemic discrimination, prejudice, inequality, gender inequality, and stigmatization of victims. In our prevention and care for sexual violence, we must uh, put our, at the heart of our efforts and decision-making the survivors, whether these are women and girls, but also men, boys, and LGBTI people, so as to guarantee the provision of legal, medical, and livelihood assistance based on specific needs and with a human rights and intersectional focus which take into account the many barriers faced by people according to their ethnic origins, age, migratory status, disability, sexual orientation or gender identity. More important still, we must recognize the fact that trauma and psychological effects can be very serious and can result in a deterioration of mental health or psycho psychosocial well-being. We must include in all humanitarian work access to this kind of service in a broad way. In all service, uh, health services, including sexual and reproductive health, and this not just from a preventive angle but as a pillar of rebuilding the social fabric. Women and girls with disabilities must be a priority group in having access to such services. We must recognize uh, that all victims uh, of sexual violence must be recognized and having, uh, have a guarantee of access to multi-sectoral assistance, compensation and redress. These processes must be designed and implemented together with the victims, ensuring swift access for them to effective, independent, impartial justice systems which have a gender focus. A lack of accountability by perpetrators and the impunity which they enjoy contribute to a repetition and recurrence of sexual violence and also to a lack of trust and fear amongst survivors to report such violence. It is therefore urgent to ensure legal and institutional frameworks which guarantee reporting, investigation, trial and punishment mechanisms. President, the Security Council must use all resources at its disposal to prevent and address this scourge. It is crucial that the sanctions committees continue to include sexual violence as a criterion for imposing sanctions on perpetrators. But these will remain limited in sco scope if they are not strengthened through cooperation and information exchange with other bodies, such as the Informal Experts Group of women on Women, Peace and Security, or the Working Group on, women in, on, on Children in Armed Conflict. Sexual violence in armed conflict is a war crime, as enshrined in the Statute of Rome, and this has been confirmed by jurisprudence of the International Criminal Court. The Security Council must refer to the ICC, uh, situations where these crimes are committed so that they do not enjoy impunity. It's also important to include specific prevention and response provisions to sexual violence when renewing mandates of peace operations, as well as increasing the deployment of gender advisors. Finally, we recognize the essential role of civil society of women peace builders and of human rights defenders in preventing and responding to sexual violence in conflicts and humanitarian contexts. They are often providing services which states are not providing and we commit to, 
president to protecting them from the attacks and violence that they fall victim to in, attach in carrying out their commendable work. Thank you very much, President. I thank the representative of Mexico for her statement, and I give the floor to the representative of Kenya. Thank you, Mr. President. Kenya thanks Vietnam for convening this open debate and all the briefers for sharing their diverse perspectives. We also welcome the Secretary General's current report on conflict-related sexual violence, particularly the focus on frameworks of cooperation with specific country and regional mechanisms. Mr. President, Kenya strongly condemns gender-based violence and its manifestation in sexual violence in all contexts and all situations. Kenya supports the upholding and strengthening of protection against gender-based violence, including under international humanitarian, uh, international human rights law. Kenya is currently undertaking its second phase of implementation of the WPS National Action Plan. Kenya calls for the Security Council and the international community to support regional efforts against conflict-related sexual violence. In particular, we call on the Council to note and support the outcomes of the ministerial level meeting of the AU Peace and Security Council that was held on 22nd March 2021, chaired by Kenya on the theme, Women, Peace, Culture, and Gender Inclusivity in Africa. The resultant communique, among others, underline the need of building the required infrastructure to provide medical and psychosocial care and trauma healing to victims and survivors of SGBV and all other violations in conflict settings and countries emerging from conflict. It also urges all member states and partners to invest in awareness programs to sensitize communities on their valuable support and structures for victims and survivors of trauma aimed at addressing stigmatization. The United Nations should and can support the implementation of such infrastructure, particularly in conflict fragile member states. Regarding the Security Council framework on WPS, Kenya welcomes the progress made in the advocacy and evolution of the normative framework addressing conflict-related sexual violence. Allow me to make two observations in regard to gaps and opportunities with the SVC agenda. First, the gender impact of interstate conflicts needs more attention, particularly where conflict-related sexual violence has the resultant effects of early marriage, girls dropping out of school, forced displacements, increased refugee and IDP living situations, and threats to local women peace builders. This calls for strengthened coordination with communal and religious leaders and the work of the PBC. Second, WPS Resolution 2242 recognizes that acts of sexual and gender-based violence are part of the strategic objectives and ideology of certain terrorist groups, including Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Al-Shabaab, and Boko Haram. The Secretary General's current report make specific reference to the link between sexual violence trafficking in persons, terrorism, and violent extremism. For instance, the report cites efforts by the UN Multipartner Trust Fund Project in Somalia in support of women formerly associated with Al-Shabaab, many of whom being survivors of conflict-related sexual violence. In view of these observations, we wish to make uh, the following recommendations. One, Resolution 2475 that underlines the rights and protection of women and children with disabilities in conflict situations needs to move from a disability needs based approach to the operationalization of full, equal, and meaningful participation of women with disabilities in leadership and decision making at all levels. Two, the protection pillar should encompass not only the protection of women, but also the protection of the grassroots and national gains achieved by women in peace negotiation processes. Three, 
We need to incorporate sexual and gender-based violence as a separate listing criteria with, with concurrent targeted sanctions against specific perpetrators in the mandates and sanctions regimes that do not have such, that, that do not have such language. Four, emphasize effective coordination between early warning mechanisms and national and local community leaders to mitigate against information and reporting gaps. Five, strengthen a survivor-centered approach that factors in all victims and comprises timely reporting of offenses and accountability and prioritizes medical, psychological, psychosocial, and economic support in alignment with Resolution 2467. And finally, pursue a stronger integration of the WPS counterterrorism and countering violent extremism agendas to ensure accountability of perpetrators of sexual violence in conflict situations. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Kenya for his statement, and I give the floor to the representative of Ireland. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. President, and I want to thank you for convening today's really important debate, and in particular for ensuring that we have had such strong voices from civil society informing us in our briefers this morning. To Caroline Atim and Dennis McGregory, thank you. Thank you for being truth tellers of the reality of sexual violence, a reality so often shrouded in stigma and obscured. Your focus on empowering survivors helps them to regain the sense of agency that these violations so horribly undermine. I also want to pay tribute to Special Representative Patton. Your work in documenting the evidence of these heinous crimes and calling to account their perpetrators makes an enormous contribution. It serves to elucidate our understanding. Importantly, evidence-based reporting reinforces our ability to address impunity. Today's work of documenting crimes will lead to tomorrow's convictions. Your work is badly needed and deeply appreciated. I was especially pleased to hear from Beatrix, the Women's Protection Advisor working with MINUSCA. In our view, ensuring the adequate resourcing of Women's Protection Advisors from regular missions budgets is crucial. This Council has an obligation to follow through on the promises it, the promises we make in the establishment of mandates. This absolutely includes women protection advisor posts. To assume our clear responsibilities, we should expand their deployment. Mr. President, the Secretary General's report war warns of the risk that COVID-19 will reverse hard-won gains on gender equality, reminding us that inequality is a root cause and a driver of sexual violence in times of conflict. Of course, it's a driver in peacetimes too. Let's be clear, to eliminate sexual and gender-based violence, including in conflict, our most fundamental task is to achieve gender equality at every level. We should not fool ourselves that the shocking sexual and gender-based violence in times of war, disease and disaster is somehow extraordinary or aberrant. Let's not fool ourselves that things will go back to normal once the crisis has passed. But in times of conflict and crisis is the transfer of violence from the private to the public sphere. We see the deliberate weaponization of the gender vice vice of the gendered violence that one in three of us who are women will experience in our lifetime. Most of the violence is suffered by women and girls from men they know. This is a kind of normal no woman wants to return to. The kind of normal we cannot afford to return to. I echo therefore the words of the Secretary General that recovery from this pandemic demands us to silence the guns and amplify the voices of women peace builders and to invest in public welfare rather than the instruments of warfare. To succeed, we must support the courageous work of grassroots and women-led organizations, as well as brave women human rights defenders. At a minimum, 
we must protect them from reprisals. Our recovery policies must also recognise the intersecting forms of discrimination, the discrimination that compounds vulnerability to violence, as Caroline so powerfully attested today. To build back better, we need to advance equality and participation for all, including those with disabilities, LGBTI plus persons, migrants and refugees, and members of racial and ethnic minorities. And let's remember, this council has the means to act. We have put in place a robust framework to deal with conflict-related sexual violence over the last decade. And yet, compliance by parties to conflict is appallingly, shamefully low. 70% of parties listed in the Secretary General's report have been appearing in the list for five years or more without taking corrective action. The fact is, we are failing in our responsibility if we do not ask ourselves why this is. This Council can and must do more with the tools at its disposal. It's our responsibility to do what? We believe we must fully implement the recommendations of the IEG on women, peace and security. We believe that we should ensure that monitoring and early warning processes on CRSV are incorporated into all peacekeeping and special political missions that include protection of civilians' mandate. We believe we need to examine our use of targeted sanctions, specifically the designated the designation criteria of conflict-related sexual violence and listing of sanctioned individuals. This is an underutilized tool to deter and punish sexual violence and conflict. We need to bring together our work on sanctions and on gender more systematically. Ireland supports the call by the Secretary General to invite the Special Representative on Sexual Violence and Conflict to share information with sanctions committees, and we will play our part in advancing that effort. Sanctions are not our only tools for seeking accountability. As Special Representative Patton has said, the fight against RSV is the fight against impunity. Rape and other forms of sexual violence are not somehow lesser crimes. They can constitute war crimes, crimes against humanity, or constitutive acts with respect to genocide. Let's face it, the persistently paltry record of investigations, prosecutions, and convictions for conflict-related sexual violence is fundamentally a failure of political will. Today's debate, Mr. President, is not about some vague concept. It's about the reality of our work here on international peace and security. The ICC's recent conviction of Dominic Ongwen and its affirmation of Bosco in Taganda's conviction are encouraging developments, as is the continued work of Colombia's transitional justice mechanisms. But they are all too rare, and we believe that this Council must reflect on its failure to make effective use of the accountability tools at its disposal, including the referral of situations to the ICC. We can draw a straight line from impunity for sexual violence in the past to the recurrence of violence in the future. In 2017, sexual and gender-based violence was a hallmark of the Tatmadaw's operations in northern Myanmar and in Rahine. Today, they turn their guns on civilians. As we heard from the, uh, the SRSG today, deeply distressing reports of horrific sexual violence continue to emerge from Ethiopia, including abuses perpetrated by armed actors in the conflict in Tigray. The SRSG has spoken of acts that may amount to sexual atrocities. These and other violations must cease immediately. We call on all armed parties to the conflict to fulfill their obligations under international humanitarian and human rights law and end hostilities, which will also help to facilitate humanitarian access. We call on them to ensure their forces respect and protect civilian populations, particularly women and children, from all human rights abuses, and that they explicitly condemn all sexual violence. We welcome the announcement by the High Commissioner for Human Rights confirming plans 
for a joint investigation with the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission into human rights violations in Tigray, including sexual violence. This is an urgent task to bring an end to ongoing violations, and it's also vital for accountability to bring perpetrators to justice, whatever their affiliation. We are in full support of the High Commissioner in this critical undertaking. Mr. President, as I conclude, the war correspondent Christina Lamb has, noticed, has noted the absence of women's names in war memorials. The stigma of rape in war belongs not to its victims, but to its perpetrators. The stories of survivors of sexual violence, mostly women, need to be told. Importantly, they need to be truly heard, but that's not enough. We must demand the prosecution of the crime of conflict-related sexual violence on an equal basis with other war crimes and crimes against humanity. The survivors of these crimes deserve nothing less than justice. They deserve redress. They deserve access to comprehensive survivor-centered services, including sexual and reproductive health. Above all, they're entitled to the right to participate on a full, equal and meaningful basis in public life. Mr. President, that would be a fitting memorial. Thank you. I thank the representative of Ireland for her statement. And I now give the floor to the representative of Norway. Thank you, President. And thank you to the special representative and our distinguished briefers for sharing your important insights. The courageous leadership of Dr. McCrege and Mrs. Atim is truly inspiring and crucial. Thanks also to Mrs. Kajun. Norway commends you and your tireless work. President, conflict-related sexual violence is a viol violation of international humanitarian law and a violation and abuse of human rights. One which primarily affects women and girls, but also men and boys. It may also constitute a war crime or a crime against humanity. Crimes of this gravity cannot simply be accepted as a side effect of armed conflict. President, shortly after the adoption of Resolution 2467, the SGBV conference in Oslo brought together a wide range of actors, making hundreds of commitments to end SGBV in humanitarian crisis and conflict. Despite progress made, the recent Secretary General's report confirms that sexual violence continues to be deliberately used as a tactic of war, torture and terror. These documented incidents represent just the tip of the iceberg. The report paints a harrowing picture of sexual violence in the DRC, South Sudan and Tigray. Women were also specifically targeted for their activism, including in Afghanistan, Colombia, and Yemen. We call on all parties to implement the Secretary General's recommendation. We particularly note the commitment by the government of Ethiopia to investigate the many accounts of brutal and systematic sexual violence in Tigray. Credible and independent investigations are essential. We therefore call for making full use of the support offered by the OHCHR and the Office of SRG Patton. President, it is imperative that conflict-related sexual violence is addressed in ceasefire and peace agreements, including in the definition of prohibited acts and in ensuring monitoring and implementation of commitments. We must turn commitments into compliance and resolutions into results. Resolution 2467 calls for strengthened focus on justice and accountability and a survivor-centered approach 
we must ensure its full implementation by keeping the rights of survivors in all their diversity at the forefront. Support to survivors must be age and gender sensitive and include access to health care, sexual and reproductive health and rights, psychosocial support and access to justice. We must and we must ensure survivors' full, equal, and meaningful participation. We must also tackle intersecting inequalities and root causes. We condemn the targeting of people based on disabilities and actual or perceived sexual orientation and gender identity. We are also appalled by the increase of, in SRSV against children. We regret that states carry the responsibility to protect women and children from rape and sexual violence. As chair of the Working Group for Children and Armed Conflicts, we call on our fellow council members to work to adopt strong and operational conclusions. President, we also need a more comprehensive, coordinated and targeted effort by peace operations in combating sexual violence. This is why we supported the, the production of the policy and handbook on preventing and responding to conflict-related sexual violence, which provides practical guidance to civilian, military, and police components. We also look forward to the first report on peacekeeping missions implementation of CRSV mandates. Thankfully, we already have examples of best practice to build on including the ongoing work of ANMIS in supporting the implementation of the National Action Plan on CRSV through capacity building and awareness raising. We are proud to count Nor Norwegian personnel among the UN police team supporting the South Sudanese police in investigating sexual and gender-based violence. President, in closing, I would like to make four points on how Norway believes we should move forward. First, we must ensure a survivor-centered approach, one which demands the full, equal and meaningful participation of women and survivors in all diversity. Second, protection against conflict-related sexual violence must remain a key priority for this council and we must make use of all means at our disposal. Sexual violence as a standalone designation criterion for sanctions must be applied when applicable, and it should be a criterion in more sanction regimes. In this respect, we welcome the recent decision by the Yemen Sanction Committee to list individuals on the basis of sexual violence. Third, our effort must seek to prevent sexual violence. This includes fighting impunity. We must do more to ensure that perpetrators are brought to justice. We need an appropriate mechanism through which the Council can monitor compliance by parties to conflict. Finally, we must maintain the momentum from the Oslo Conference to make SGBV prevention and response a key humanitarian priority. This council must be a strong voice. We cannot allow our political commitments being reversed by the COVID-19. I thank you. I thank the representative of Norway for her statement, and I give the floor to the representative of India. Thank you, Mr. President. At the outset, we thank Vietnam for convening the open debate on this important issue. We also thank the Secretary General for his report, SRSG Pramila Patton for her insights, and all distinguished briefer, briefers for sharing their views. Sexual violence and armed conflicts perpetrated by the state and non-state actors is a weapon used to subjugate the people. It fuels displacement, destabilizes and traumatizes communities, weakens governance, and imperils the opportunities for post-conflict reconciliation and stability. Despite the strong framework put in place by the Security Council over the past decade, 
the level of compliance by parties to the conflict remains alarmingly low. The gap between what is recommended and the reality in the field remains. Mr. President, in order to prevent the atrocities and the culture of impunity and to rehabilitate and reintegrate the survivors, my delegation wishes to highlight the following points. First, it is vital for member states to develop a comprehensive legal framework in line with international standards to ensure the effective prosecution of sexual violence as a self-standing crime. National governments have the primary responsibility for prosecuting and deterring such crimes and conflict situations on their territories, even if these are alleged to have been committed by non-state actors. Where required, the UN could assist member states in augmenting their capacities to deal with this issue. Second, member states should adopt a victim-centered approach to preventing and responding to sexual violence and armed conflicts in line with Resolution 2467. States must ensure adequate funding for comprehensive, non-discriminatory and multi-sectoral assistance for victims of sexual violence like medical, psychological, social and legal services. Third, understanding the nexus between terrorism, financing of violent extremist groups, trafficking and sexual violence in armed conflicts must inform council action on this important matter. Fourth, the sanctions regimes and other targeted measures by the council need to be strengthened to utilize their full potential to advance women's protection from sexual violence in situations of armed conflicts, including by listing individuals and entities involved in sexual violence against women in armed conflicts. Fifth, greater participation of women in conflict resolution and post-conflict reconciliation processes needs to be promoted to address deep-rooted inequality and subordination in the society. It is important to make this a precondition for any peace process to succeed. Sixth, mainstreaming of gender, pers gender perspective in peacekeeping operations and increasing women's representation in peacekeeping are prerequisites for prevention and response. Seventh, and not the least, to promote synergy and effective coordination. It is imperative to avoid duplication in the working of the various UN organs. The issue of violence against women, including sexual violence, is discussed by other UN bodies, including at the Human Rights Council. Deliberations at the Security Council, therefore, should remain focused on such atrocities perpetrated in situations of armed conflict that threaten international peace and security. Mr. President, in 2017, Prime Minister Narendra Modi joined the circle of leadership on the prevention of and response to sexual exploitation and abuse in United Nations operations. India has also signed the Secretary General's Voluntary Compact against sexual exploitation and abuse. India has the distinction of sending the first all-women formed police unit contingent to Liberia in 2007. This unit not just managed criminality, deterred sexual and gender-based gender violence, and helped rebuild safety and confidence among the Liberian population, but operationalized the spirit of Security Council Resolution 1325 into action. These courageous Indian women patrolled Monrovian streets at night, taught Liberian women self-defense skills, conducted classes on sexual violence, maintained calm during the Ebola crisis, and devoted time and resources above and beyond the call of duty to protect the local communities. The legacy these Indian women peacekeepers left behind was the next generation of female Liberian leaders who are serving in the national police today. Major Suman Gavani, an Indian woman peacekeeper deployed earlier with UNMIS, was awarded the UN Military Gender Advocate for the year 2019 for her role in mentoring over 230 UN military observers and ensured the presence of women military observers in each of the mission's team sites. She also trained South Sudanese government forces and helped them launch their action plan to prevent conflict-related sexual violence. India welcomes the Uniform Gender Parity Strategy to increase the number of women peacekeepers. We also support increasing the deployment of women protection advisors for effective monitoring, analysis, and reporting arrangements on conflicts-related sexual violence in the field. Mr. President, 
the burdening of the healthcare system and the economic fallout due to the covid-19 pandemic threatens to put women and girls in armed conflict at even higher risk member states need to work together to mitigate the impact of the pandemic on sexual violence and armed conflicts and to preserve our hard won progress in this field let me conclude by acknowledging the progress that has been achieved by the un entities in monitoring reporting and listing the persistent offenders over the years however we need to continue focusing on closing the compliance gaps through a range of context specific and inclusive actions india reaffirms its commitments to actively contribute to a collective endeavor in effectively tackling sexual violence in situations of armed conflict i thank you mr president i thank the representative of india for his statement and i give the floor to the representative of singh bang sang and the grenadines thank you for the floor mr president and for convening for your work in convening this important meeting we also thank our distinguished briefers srsg patton dr mcquege ms atim and ms atinga colin for your thoughtful yet sobering briefings the world has been gripped by intersecting crises and inequalities of epic proportions these conditions have compounded the experience and increased rates of sexual and gender based violence in conflict particularly against women and girls today we recommit to ending the enduring inequalities protracted conflict and underdevelopment which contribute to unconscionable levels of conflict related sexual violence at a time when st vincent and the grenadines is confronted with severe a severe crisis of explosive volcanic eruptions in addition to the social and economic repercussions of the covid-19 pandemic we speak with an even deeper sense of pain urgency and commitment to addressing humanity's suffering first we commend the invaluable contribution of women civil society including for example the women protection networks in darfur facilitating referrals and working to enhance the profiling of perpetrators of sexual violence further we condemn any attacks against women civil society networks secondly on the reporting resulting from fear of reprisals and shame remains an enduring challenge with this in mind we call for survivor centered responses that prioritize women's and girls desires at every stage stage of their trauma and recovery experience women civil society and community organizations working to prevent and respond to sexual violence must be consistently funded and supported as they perform critical prevention response and recovery work with women girls and children we recognize important actions to address conflict related sexual violence including the establishment of one stop centers in south sudan specialized courts in all 34 provinces in afghanistan with 32 headed by women the launch of the sexual and gender based violence helpline in the drc by the united nations and of course the support of the office of the srsg on sexual violence in providing model legislative guidance on conflict related sexual violence to national authorities notwithstanding important progress made effective comprehensive women and girl led actions against conflict related sexual violence remain elusive this brings me to my third point which is re also related to the ongoing pandemic with funding being divested toward pandemic mitigation measures we urge authorities to designate sexual and gender based violence response as central to pandemic recovery planning and funding displaced and refugee women and girls are among the most affected during the pandemic we call for the inclusion of retention of key health and psychosocial services as national emergency response plans are adapted over time such plans must also include adequate socioeconomic recovery and reintegration support further continued collaboration between regional organizations and the un to support the development operationalization and adaptation of survivor centered national action plans remain crucial diverse women and girls civil society and community organizers must occupy central roles in decision making budgeting design implementation and the monitoring of compliance the enduring effects of rape trafficking sexual slavery and terrorism against women and girls by armed terrorist groups operating across borders 
further emphasize the need for national, regional, and multilateral cooperation. This includes joint up cross-border monitoring and response capabilities, ongoing regional and multilateral support to strengthen national accountability frameworks is necessary to not only end impunity, but also to ensure reparations for survivors. Finally, Mr. President, mandate authorizations, renewals, and implementation must prioritize gender analysis and gender justice with the requisite focus on participation, prevention, protection, relief, and recovery, including the consistent deployment of women protection advisors to all peacekeeping and political missions. Eliminating conflict-related sexual violence requires multi-level, multi-actor approaches that are tied to broader gender-responsive security and development actions. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Sing Ming Sing and the Grenadine for her statement. And I give the floor to the representative of Estonia. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank our advisors for their presentations and, even more crucially, their daily tireless work. I also thank the special representative for the presentation of the annual report on conflict-related sexual violence and welcome the concrete recommendations therein. It is the 12th dedicated report by the Secretary General, which clearly shows that conflict-related sexual violence unforgivable and still unpunished, is widely used as a weapon of war across conflicts. We need to treat it systematically as such, picking up its early signs, countering its use, making it part of ceasefires and peace agreements, and making sure that those who commit it are punished and not included in amnesty provisions ignoring its severity and impact. We also need to admit that the victims and survivors of conflict-related sexual violence are victims and survivors of war. They deserve support and justice. We cannot address conflict-related violence, neither as states nor as the Security Council, without recognizing the need to ensure the full enjoyment of human rights, including sexual and reproductive health and, uh, and rights by women and girls. The Secretary General's report confirms that gender inequality is a root cause and a driver of sexual violence in times of conflict and peace. It turns women and girls into targets and means to wage war. It con contributes to stigma, victim blaming, and underreporting of sexual violence. Gender inequality, compounded by harmful social norms, also means that the price for sexual violence remains low and or non-existent and results in gaps in legal frameworks and services for survivors. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated these inequalities, even more so for women and girls in conflict situations, as the Council recognized in Resolution 2532. The Secretary General has drawn attention to the reports of sexual violence against women and girls in Tigray. We have acknowledged the, acknowledged the Ethiopian government's willingness to collaborate with international human rights experts, and we urge it to guarantee an independent and credible investigation and unimpeded access of experts as well humanitarian aid organizations to assist the survivors of sexual violence. In Yemen, conflict-related sexual violence has been reportedly committed by all parties, including in detention and in IDP camps. We welcome the adoption of the Council Resolution 2564, which designated an individual based on, uh, based on actions related to the systematic detention, torture, and sexual violence against politically active women. <laughs> 
we reiterate our call for accountability for conflict-related sexual violence, which is long overdue in Syria as well as for violence committed by the Tatmado in Myanmar. As a member of the Council, Security Council, Estonia will continue to underline the fundamental importance of human rights, including women and girls' human rights in combating conflict-related sexual violence. We continue to call for women's full, equal, and meaningful participation in peace processes, as well as COVID-19 recovery. We have and will continue to underline the absolutely crucial importance of accountability through domestic systems of justice or, if appropriate, through the International Criminal Court. Estonia continues its support to the team of experts, which in 2020 provided technical assistance to the prosecution and trial of Ntabo Taberi Sheka, redress and reparations for survivors are part of accountability. We support the designation and use of sexual violence as a standalone criterion for sanctions and the SRSG's briefings to the Security Council sanctions committees. We encourage all parties to conflict to adopt specific commitments to address conflict-related sexual violence. We continue to call for a non-discriminatory and rights-based approach to assisting survivors of sexual violence, respecting their diversity and needs. This includes the provision of comprehensive services, including psychological, legal, and sexual, and reproductive health services and livelihood support. We continue to support the mandating and deployment of women, uh, women protection advisors and look forward to their deployment in Libya and Sudan. We see sufficient capacity and funding as key for the functioning of the monitoring and reporting arrangements. We will continue to call for the Council to speak up on reprisals and attacks, including targeted sexual violence against, against women active in public life women human rights and those providing assistance to survivors of sexual violence. Mr. President, the shadow that conflict-related sexual violence casts is long. Its memory is carried forward and it can fuel endless cycles of violence, bringing justice and addressing the rights and needs of its survivors is one step towards breaking the silence. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Estonia for his statement, and I give the floor to the representative of Niger. Thank you, President. We would like to thank our briefers who spoke about the most terrible consequences of the conflicts. Thousands of people are suffering from inhuman sexual violence during conflict, committed as a strategy of war, political repression, of torture and of terror. And the report of the Secretary General on this confirms the disastrous consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic on the incidence of conflict-related sexual violence, particularly reduced access to justice and care services, greater fragility of control and monitoring systems, and a reduction in financial resources. One of the most effective ways of combating this violence is prevention, particularly access to high-quality education, Attacks against education and schools are becoming more and more worrisome. We must therefore protect access to education, particularly for girls, who in countries affected by conflicts are half as likely to attend school as those living in countries at peace. They are also more likely to be subjected to sexual and gender-based violence on their way to school. The presidential statement on attacks against schools adopted by the Security Council last September under Niger's presidency recalls the need to take into account the heightened risk of sexual violence against girls who are deprived of access to education. 
oft and these often undergo forced displacement and live in zones embroiled in local violence. Particularly, uh, this particularly affects children with disabilities who are most vulnerable. I should like to draw the Council's attention on that of Member States to the increased vulnerability faced by women and girls who suffer the multiple effects of conflicts, forced displacements, sometimes exacerbated by climate change and economic precarity and migration for some as well. In this regard, Niger reiterates its disquiet regarding the living conditions of migrants and refugees intercepted at sea and brought to Libya, where women migrants are in overcrowded detention centres and subjected to violations of all kind. Given their increased precarity, there is a need to review the policy of bringing migrants and refugees intercepted at sea to Libya. President. For a number of years, the country to the Sahel have been facing a, a security crisis exacerbated by a number of factors, which the presence of armed, including the presence of armed terrorist groups, proliferation of light weapons, a lack of socio-economic opportunities, and intercommunal tensions. Emergency situations and humanitarian crises linked to natural catastrophes and the resulting displacements exacerbate the vulnerability of women and girls. It has been noted in the Lake Chad Basin region that terrorist groups such as Boko Haram kidnap girls and women to then forcibly integrate them into the ranks of prisoners of war and use them as sex slaves or human bombs. This was the case on the 14th of April 2014, exactly seven years ago today when Boko Haram carried out the mass kidnap of 276 girls in Chibok. Many of them were taken from their families forever and no longer allowed to quench their thirst to learn and also subjected to inim unimaginable violence. Against a backdrop marked by insecurity, this kind of serious incident has consequences on the schooling of girls who are at a greater risk of no longer attending school, which makes them more vulnerable to early marriage, forced uh, pregnancy and other gender-based violence. There must be a holistic uh, care for survivors of sexual violence in areas most affected by the security crisis. We have therefore created centres specialising in this. Uh, we have a transit and guidance centre with uh, demobilisation and reintegration programmes which are adapted to child survivors. President, my delegation is convinced of the importance of member states and the United Nations of setting an example in responding to questions linked to um, sexual violence in conflict. Recently, following allegations of violence against three women by the soldiers deployed in the three border zone, the authorities of the countries concerned reacted promptly. As soon as they were made aware of the facts, they undertook reliable, rapid investigations jointly with the National Commission of Human Rights and a, com a mission led by the commander of the Central Zone of the G5 Sahel Joint Force. Whilst these cases are isolated, we welcome the immediate measures taken to ensure investigation, protection of civilians and attention to victims, but also the application of disciplinary measures and sanctions against the soldiers involved. This tripartite cooperation has mobilised civil society, including communities, states and the judicial services, and could serve as an example in the implementation of the rapid response system in other situations where sometimes allegations of sexual violence are not followed up upon. There is a culture of impunity around sexual violence, including at United Nations level, particularly in areas affected by conflict, whoever the perpetrators are. This must cease. The credibility of the missions and the fundamental values we depend are at stake, and this is also a question of justice. In this regard, we welcome the commitment of the senior levels of the United Nations on areas linked to rights for victims and a change in the institutional culture with zero tolerance for sexual violence. President, my delegation would like to make the following additional recommendations. Firstly, the adoption by Member States of a survivor-based approach in line with Resolution 2467 with the implementation or strengthening of legal and judicial assistance as well as the health, psychological, social and economic dimensions.
ensuring presence of specialists in the protection of children is important, as well as the deployment of gender-based advisors. The survivor-based approach must therefore not only be a multi-partner one, but also multidisciplinary, with accessible high-quality services, which take into account the gender-specific contexts and the way in which multiple crises exacerbate vulnerabilities amongst certain groups. Thirdly, the implementation of effective programs, and including reliable and uh, disaggregated data. We must uh, increase data collection with local authorities and the role of civil society, particularly local human rights organizations. To conclude, we must break the cycle of double victimization for survivors, as well as silence, taboos and social stigmatization. And this cannot be done without local action within communities. We must collectively tackle the root causes of sexual violence, including gender-based discrimination, a lack of economic opportunity and toxic masculinity. Access to high-quality education, particularly in conflict-affected zones, is crucial. We must use this current crisis to open a new era which is more just, more equal and where conflict-related sexual violence is completely eradicated. I thank you. I thank the representative of Niger for his statement and I give the floor to the representative of Russian Federation. Thank you, Mr. President. Allow me to thank you for organizing this meeting. We are grateful to the briefers for their contribution to today's discussion. The Security Council meets each year to discuss measures to combat crimes of a sexual nature in armed conflict. We hear speakers sincerely condemning these crimes and the shared stance on decisively combating this revolting phenomenon is reaffirmed. The Secretariat produces model legislative provisions and detailed plans. Experts are involved. And the forces and resources of the organization are brought to bear in international peacekeeping presences and special political missions. The problem exists and the international community is aware of it. The need to combat this evil is something that absolutely all members of the Security Council agree upon. Why is it then that the UN Secretary General in his reports from one year to the next essentially describes an absence of progress in this area? Why are the targeted, well-structured and properly thought through recommendations of his special representative butting up against realities on the ground? What, for example, is preventing belligerents guaranteeing the full and meaningful participation of women, girls and survivors of sexual violence in decision-making processes, as the report proposes? The answer is all too often a simple one. It's the nature of war itself, one of hatred and animosity in society, often stoked from outside. A state in which law justice and viable governance institutions are absent when might really does make right. We must do all we can to stop conflicts, eliminate their root causes and rebuild a resilient society because it's just such a resilient society that will be able to vanquish impunity and put a stop to violence, including sexual violence. Mr. President, we welcome the work of the Special Representative of the Secretary-General, Ms. Pramila Patton. We highly appreciate her work on uh, national capacity building, her work to develop dialogue with religious and other traditional leaders, and to address the stigmatization of survivors of sexual violence and for their rehabilitation. It's important that the humanitarian work of her office not be associated with any political preferences, 
and that it should not be seen as pandering to one party to a conflict or turning a blind eye to the crimes of another. We therefore urge the authors of the report to take a particularly meticulous approach to the list of parties that are credibly suspected of committing acts of sexual violence. All suspicions must by definition be credible, the facts must be verified, and the sources of information must be identified. Mr. President, despite the additional difficulties that the pandemic has brought with it, we have not lost hope that the measures we are taking, including today's debate, will help end violence against civilians, including sexual violence, for the good of international peace and security. Thank you for your attention. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation for his statement, and I give the floor to the representative of France. President, allow me, first of all, to commend Vietnam's commitment to the fight against conflict-related sexual violence. I would also like to thank the Special Representative, as well as Dr. McQuaggy and other representatives of civil society for their briefings. France shares the concern expressed in, this report, in the report and in statements made today. Conflict-related sexual violence continue unpunished, particularly in the context of the pandemic. I'm thinking particularly about the situations in Tigray, in Ethiopia, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in Syria, or in the Central African Republic. To the now is the time for action, not words. Our collective responsibility is to guarantee the implementation of all relevant council resolutions. We must also ensure respect for commitments undertaken by parties concerned. France strongly condemns the recourse to sexual violence as a tactic of war and a tool of terror. We also condemn all sexist, misogynist or homophobic discourse which ex exacerbates violence. Here I would like to make four points. Firstly, all forms of violence must be punished. The pandemic has reduced access to police, justice and health services non-reporting of complaints and also impunity remain major problems. This is particularly the case in Syria, where France is resolutely committed so that the perpetrators of such crime be punished. France believes in the importance of justice, reparation and the guarantees of non-repetition. We commend the role of the International Criminal Court for its contribution to tackling this scourge, and we thus take also note of the first, the recent sentencing of Dominic Ongwen in Uganda. We must also adopt a victim-centered approach and guarantee comprehensive care for survivors. These survivors should have access to medical, psychological and social support to foster their return and support their return to normal life. This is why France is continuing its financial commitment of 6.2 million euros to the Global Fund for Survivors of Conflict-Related Sexual Violence, created by Nobel Peace Prize laureates Dr. McQuaggy and Madame Rouad. We must, in addition, uh, remove barriers to access to rights and also to uh, sexual reproductive health services. We regret the politicization of these issues, which is leading to the greater interest of women and girls being lo lost. In Chad, France is financing 5 million euros for a project for women's empowerment through better access to these services and psychosocial and health support. The protection of these rights will be at the heart of, our, of the process for the Generation Equality Forum launched in Mexico and will conclude in Paris. 
between the 30th of June and the 2nd of July this year. Finally, it is necessary for this council to do more. France will continue to support uh, the inclusion of this violence in mandates and also to promote the implementation of women, peace and security resolutions, as well as making available the necessary resources for teams on the ground. In addition, the sanctioning of other of, of perpetrators of sexual violence is necessary. And the Security Council, we must do more for this. This fight must be waged tirelessly and without compromise. France is committed to do so, in particular as we approach the Generation Equality Forum. Thank you. I thank the representative of France for his statement. I give the floor to the representative of Tunisia. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like at the outset to thank all briefers for their insightful comments and to particularly commend the inclusive approach in the selection of the briefers today. Conflicts always have a devastating impact on all civilians without exceptions. However, there is a need to recognize speci specifically the disproportionate impacts of conflicts on women and girls. First, as the report of the Secretary General indicates, women and girls are in many instances utilized as a weapon of war or of terrorism during conflict. Such systematic targeting aims at violating the dignity of women and girls by subjecting them to sexual and gender-based violence such as rapes, trafficking, and sexual slavery. Second, these crimes committed against them are often not recognized as a, as a tactic of war or uh, of terrorism, but rather as simple acts of violence, and therefore the perpetrators do not face proper accountability that reflects the seriousness of the crime. Third, access to justice and remedies is hindered largely, largely due to the absence of gender-responsive services and to the pre prominence of negative social norms blaming victims and stigmatizing them. This reveals the multi-layered nature of violations against the survivors, which start with the conflict itself and carry out even in post-conflict settings due to the lack of accountability. And finally, women and girls are often marginalized from post-conflict peace processes with only 13% of negotiators, 6% of mediators, and 6% of signatories in major peace processes around the world. For this reason, any post-conflict peace process is likely to overlook the particular vulnerabilities, grievances, and needs of women and girls in conflict and post-conflict post settings, including the sexual and gender-based violence against them. Mr. President, first, and foremost, the best way to eradicate conflict-related rela sexual violence is to put an end to conflicts themselves and to build peaceful and resilient societies. We welcome in this regard the recommendation contained in the Secretary General's report to immediately seize all acts of sexual violence in conflict consistent with Security Council Resolution 2532 presented by Tunisia and France and his call for a global ceasefire. Tunisia strongly believes in a survivor-centered approach. In this regard, we reiterate that survivors of conflicts-related sexual violence do not constitute a, homo a homogeneous group and that they require tailored measures and services and that respond to their different needs and context. Most important, importantly, we need to, imp we need to provide and sufficiently fund psychological, legal, and medical services that include sexual and reproductive health and rights, as well as socioeconomic opportunities to ensure the reintegration and empowerment of survivors. We also need to put an end to impunity by delivering justice to the victims and survivors that restores their rights and pre pre preserves their dignity. It is essential to put in place and strengthen robust national, legal, and judicial measures, as well as 
UN targeted sanctions that reflect the seriousness of these heinous crimes. Tunisia is committed to put a stronger emphasis on conflicts related sexual violence com- committed by terrorist groups as a tactic of terrorism, which we included uh, in the PRST adopted in January and which we will continue to advocate for during the ongoing review of the global counterterrorism strategy as well as in order in other upcoming processes for different subsidiary bodies of the Security Council. Mr. President, it is important to reflect on why sexual violence, among all things, is being weaponized during conflict. In fact, we see this phenomenon as deeply rooted in historical and structural gender inequalities and unequal power relations between men and women. Patriarchal and negative social norms increase the vulnerability of women and girls in the face of in the face of conflicts. Therefore, we can prevent conflict-related sexual violence by tackling its underlying drivers, by promoting gender equality and the human rights, by bringing national legislations in line with international norms and standards, and by implementing the existing normative framework on women, peace, and security. Such exercise requires the whole of government and the whole of society approach that involves an active role and partnership with civil society organizations, local communities, feminist groups, girls and youth-led organizations, private sector, and all other relevant stakeholders to promote gender equality and the full, equal, effective, and meaningful participation and leadership of women and girls in all public and private spheres. It is of most importance to ensure the continuity of the necessary funding mechanisms within the UN system and to civil society sectors in this regard. I thank you. I thank the representative of Tunisia for his statement. I shall now make a statement in my capacity as a representative of Vietnam. We would like to thank Chad C. Patton for her insightful briefing. We would like also to thank other briefers for bringing their valuable experiences to the discussion today. Colleagues, over the years, sexual violence continues to occur in global conflict with traumatizing impact on the victims, particularly vulnerable women and girls. We are concerned about the tremendous suffering of victims from physical and psychological injuries discrimination, and social exclusion associated with uh, sexual violence. Lacking access to education, livelihood, and economic opportunities, these victims are also easily subject to the stigmatization, human trafficking, and armed conflict and terrorist recruitment, which prolong the vicious circles of violence and sufferings. Why the international community had given increasing attention and commitment to the issues it is regrettable that the situation in the past year remaining remain alarming and had been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. As reflected by the report of the Secretary General, among others, gender-based inequality, which is the root causes and drivers for sexual violence in times of conflict, had been amplified. The pursuit of justice and redress had been further complicated why new concern on gender-specific protection arises? Against this backdrop, we share many points raised by other members and would like to stress the following. First, a comprehensive perspective. We emphasize the need to take a comprehensive perspective and redouble our efforts to prevent and respond to sexual violence in conflict. In this regard, family assistance and access to, re- to services are of critical importance to victims of sexual violence. This may include healthcare, psychological and legal support, vocational training, employment opportunity, and socioeconomic reintegration. And at the same time, measures aimed at addressing the root causes of sexual violence in conflict remain critical too. In this process, the consideration of a survivor-centered approach as mentioned in the report of the Sikh Jain, 
should always be in focus. Second, gender equality and women empowerment. Vietnam underscores the importance of promoting gender equality and women political, social, and economic empowerment. We recognize the links between sexual violence and gender inequality. The full and equal participation of women in decision making and peace processes is a prerequisite to all prevention of conflict and sexual violence in, in conflict. They do ensure that national policies could adequately address the need and interest of the victim, raise greater awareness and overcome stigma and discrimination. It is also important to enhance women economic empowerment to assist victims in their recovery and reintegration. Third, collective effort. Why states have the primary responsibility in this regard? The international community, particularly the UN agency, programs and peacekeeping missions can provide much needed development assistance, capacity building, technical support and training. We encourage the inclusion of conflict-related sexual violence prevention and response in mandates, authorization, and renewal of peace operation, as well as the accelerated development of women protection advisors to peace operation and offices of United Nations were mandated. Women protection advisors who work closely among community on the ground should be provided with necessary resources to fulfill their tasks in, in peacekeeping operation. We also encourage the international community to take a united and collective uh, response to effectively implement existing normative frameworks on the women peace and security agenda and on the prevention and response to the conflict-related sexual violence. Victims of sexual violence can become resilient, resilient uh, survivors when they are supported and empowered. Vietnam stands ready to engage with member states and the United Nations relevant agency in this endeavor. I thank you. I resume my function as president of the council. There are no more names inscribed on the list of the speaker. Before closing, I would like to thank once again on the distinguished participation who joined us today, and of course, all this referred to join us today. And I would like also to thank the member states and regional groups which have so far submitted written statements on the subject of today's discussion. Statements that are received by the end of today will form part of the compilation of statements from this meeting, and we look forward to receiving more. The meeting is adjourned.